I was camping in the middle of nowhere in Washington, near Mount Rainer. Like, not an official campground, just way out of the forest where I wouldn't have expected another human for miles. One night I woke up and heard something, so I went to open my tent, and there was a guy sitting by where my fire had been. Nothing particularly noteworthy about the guy, just a fairly regular looking dude just sitting there a couple feet from my tent. No bag or pack or anything with him, just a guy. He saw me open the tent, his eyes got huge like he had just seen a ghost, and he took off. It shook me up pretty badly, but over the next day I managed to put it out of my mind fairly well after writing it off as just some odd occurrence in a guy that was probably high or something and had somehow managed to set up a camp coincidentally not far from mine. Then two days after that, and 10 to 15 miles away, in totally random directions that nobody could take the same path as an accident, I was sitting by the fire that night and started hearing noises which I got more and more convinced were a person. I called out to them, and out of the darkness someone was like, do you know how to get to Bell's Canyon? I said no, I don't even think that's a real place there. They kept talking from out of my line of vision, I tried to see them with my flashlight but they yelled, aim that away and kind of spooked, and not wanting to piss off a potentially crazy person, I listened to him. After about 15 minutes of me being very freaked out, and them talking and asking completely random questions from the darkness, it sounded like the voice had gotten closer, so I shined my light that way again, and it was the same dude who had been outside my tent two nights before. He had to have followed me almost 15 miles over two days, because there is no way he could have just accidentally wound up in the same spot. As vast as that wilderness is, there's no possible way. As soon as my light hit him, he took off again. I started to chase him but didn't want to get lost in the wilderness in the dark, so I stopped pretty quickly after probably 100 to 200 feet. This one couldn't be written off because the only way he could have been in both places is if he was following me. First thing in the morning, I decided the trip was over and hiked back over the next three days, constantly doubling back, trying to throw anyone off my trail, and occasionally hiding and waiting to see if he would come by following me. I really can't describe how terrifying it was to feel like I was being hunted through the woods and to actually have to brainstorm things to avoid potentially being murdered. On the first night of hiking out, there were two times I heard what sounded like a person walking circles around my tent, but by the time I must the courage to look. Nobody was there. On the second night I heard what I thought was an animal making noises, but slowly realized it sounded more like a human making animal calls. Thankfully I didn't actually see the guy again. I literally almost cried when I finally got back to my car. The relief was so strong. To this day that was probably the most terrifying experience I've ever had. I don't know who that guy was or what his intentions were, but there's no way of getting an explanation. In the summer of 2020, my friends Alex and Violet and I decided to go on a mountain vacation. Covid cabin fever had hit us hard, and we were desperate to go out. We settled on a mountainous state and planned to camp and hike at several different locations. For one night, we thought it would be fun to book a cabin in the woods. Violet's parents had rented a fire tower once and loved it, but a cabin beside a fire tower was all we could find. It was cheap, clean, and secluded. Excited to have a night where we could be as obnoxious as we wanted, we booked it. In the weeks leading up to the trip, we decided it would be a great idea to drop acid at the cabin. Violet bought an entire sheet in preparation for our arrival. We tucked it in her bag as we pulled out of the driveway to make our way to the cabin. I remember this knot in the pit of my stomach, this aching feeling that gnawed at me. I told Alex and Violet that there was no way we could drop acid that night. Violet was pissed. We turned around and got into a massive argument, but I stood my ground. I just knew that we had no business tripping that night. Finally, the fireworks settled and we were off. The cabin was roughly 30 minutes away from the nearest town. It sat on the top of a mountain. We held our breath as we rounded the busted road that spiraled to the top. There were no pull-offs, no other campsites. Just a long winding road that led us to the cabin at the peak. We settled in and started a fire to keep us warm. As dusk gave way to night, we heard the unmistakable noise of an engine on the road and a flash of headlights. The side by side with three kids arrived and our nerves settled. They smiled, gave us a wave, climbed the fire tower, and left. We'd heard there may be occasional visitors to the fire tower, but they were the only ones who'd come by. We doused the fire and moved inside, heated some hot dogs until they were lukewarm, ate them fast, and sat in the silence. You don't know how quiet it is until you're in the middle of nowhere. You can hear every rustle of leaves, the whisper of the wind through the branches. You get so used to white noise living in the city. There's always the hum of an air conditioner, or the dim roar of traffic to focus on. Here, the closest thing to white noise was the sound of our breathing. We jumped at every noise, too frightened to speak to one another, and finally, I'd had enough. 
I cracked a few wine coolers, passed them to Alex and Violet, and slapped a board game down on the table between our bunk beds. It didn't take long for us to loosen, and we were laughing, having the ruckus good time we'd envisioned. Much soberer than we'd thought, but enough that we were able to ignore the rumble of the woods. Later, we'd all recall hearing noises in the background. The snap of a twig, the dim rumble of an engine. None of us wanted to rupture the air of nonchalance between us, so we ignored it until a human hand reached up to the window between us and slapped it three times. We were screaming in an instant. Alex called 911, put them on speakerphone, and handed his phone to me. He grabbed pokers from the fireplace and passed them out. Violet started calling family members and saying her last goodbyes. I held my breath and listened for any more noise. Whoever this was, whatever this was, would have heard us call 911, and now they were being careful to make a silent retreat. Dispatch arrived 20 minutes later, which is a lucky thing for a 1am emergency call, and they had their dogs comb the mountain. Nothing. They suggested it may have been a bear, but I could tell from their faces that they didn't believe that for a second. We'd barely cooked those hot dogs, and why would a bear smack the window by a couple of screaming kids, rather than the ones closest to the pan we'd use to cook? Why would the bear knock on the window like a human? Why, when we screamed, did the bear make a stealthy retreat? They had no answers, but they did tell us, as they sped here, they'd come across a car at the base of the mountain but that was the only sign of life they'd seen. I remember my blood ran cold, but Violet and Alex were too frazzled to absorb the weight of what they just said, and dizzied by a new horror. Violet's car, thoroughly dusted by our drive up the mountain, was covered in handprints, handprints that didn't match ours, that touched places we hadn't. We grabbed our shit by the armful and threw it inside, eager to remove every part of ourselves from this mountain. We followed the police. We made it down in record time. We found a hotel and stayed in it. It was reeking of cat piss. I couldn't sleep. The thought of that car on the road rang in my head. Remember, there was nothing else on that mountain. It was a narrow road to the top. No pull-offs, no other campsites. There was the fire tower. Maybe a visitor decided to try to spook us on their late night trip. But the kids from earlier, we'd seen their headlights. Whoever did this had stopped their vehicle further down the road and hiked the rest of their way. They didn't want to be spotted. They wanted silence. Secrecy. Whoever this was hadn't been looking for a cheap scare. They'd planned this. I don't know if it was a practical joke or the beginning of a night of terror. It was the summer before senior year in college. My little brother, always interested in military stuff, had gotten a pair of night vision goggles for his birthday, and he left them at my apartment. One night I was bored and decided to try out the goggles at a wooded hiking area nearby. In retrospect, this seems like a very stupid idea since I was all by myself, but I was young and stupid, and I got myself all excited at the possibility of seeing deer and other woodland creatures in their natural nighttime habitat. I was familiar with these woods. My best friend and I had hiked there at night before, and we'd never run into anyone else. Our area is mostly rural and pretty safe, so I didn't anticipate any trouble. I parked in the little sparsely lit parking area, ignored the park closes at 10 sign, and entered the woods with my night vision goggles in hand. It was the half moon that night, and that was the only light that filtered down through the canopy of trees. It was pretty dark, and I didn't want to put on the goggles until I'd find a place to sit down. So I lit my way with the mini mag light on my keychain. A couple of times, I thought I heard a little rustling in the woods a far distance away. But it was nothing out of the ordinary, and I put it down to animal activity. Hopefully the deer I'd come hoping to see. After I'd hike in a fair distance, I found a fallen log to sit on and put on the goggles. I don't know if you've ever used night vision goggles before but the effect was impressive. For a while, I had a blast looking around from my fallen log vantage point. Some chipmunks played around in the leaves nearby, and a big owl blinked its lamp-like eyes at me from a tree branch. No deer though, and I started to think that maybe they wouldn't be likely to come anywhere near me, darkness or not, so I decided to find a place where I could be a little more hidden. I made my way a little deeper into the woods, and finally found a huge tree, perfect for climbing. I've always loved climbing trees, so it was nothing for me to hoist myself up a few branches and settle in to wait for my deer. I didn't get to see any, but I did see, lit up in a bright night vision green after about 10 minutes of waiting. It was a man, dressed head to toe in dark colored clothing, making his way stealthily through the woods. He was coming from the same direction I'd come, and was clearly trying to stay hidden, moving from tree to tree, and glancing around carefully before moving on again. It looked very much like he was looking for someone. It took me a few moments to notice that he was carrying something, and when I saw what it was, the hairs on the back of my neck stood up. He had a knife, a big one, and he was gripping it as if he expected to use it in the very near future. It wasn't deer hunting season, and this was a nature preserve, where hunting of any kind was prohibited, and at any rate, the guy was alone and not dressed like a hunter. 
There were no deer in sight, and very few hunters kill their prey with knives. I was suddenly horribly aware of my situation. A young woman alone, weaponless, in the middle of the woods at night. This was the 90s, so no cell phones. And even if I had one, I wouldn't have felt safe using it as it would draw his attention. I didn't know how he was able to see so well in the dark. I guess his eyes had just adjusted, and I was terrified he would look up and see me. I sat there, afraid to move, afraid to breathe and watched him as he continued his methodical and stealthy process of scanning the forest for who or whatever the hell he was stalking. I scanned around but couldn't see anyone else, even from my high vantage point, and the sickening thought struck me that he might be looking for me. I remember the rustling noise I'd heard in the woods when I first arrived, and then I thought back further and remembered something else. A white car that had followed too close behind me for most of my drive to the nature preserve. I'd been annoyed and a little freaked out at the time, but when I'd turned into the nature preserve parking area, the white car had passed me and driven on its way, and I hadn't thought anything more of it. Now I wondered. If this was the driver of that car, if he'd circled back and seen my parked car alone in the lot, if he'd come in after me. I sat, paralyzed with fear, and watched the man for what felt like forever, but it was probably another half hour or so. There was a heart-stopping moment when he paused right underneath my tree, and I was sure he was going to look up and find me, but he didn't. After a while, he seemed to give up on whatever plan he had in mind. I heard him say, fuck it, and he started heading back in the direction he came from, the direction of the parking area. I stayed in the tree, wet with sweat and crying, until the sun came up a few hours later. Then I climbed down and still terrified, gripping the little can of pepper spray on my keychain. I made my way as fast as I could to the parking lot. The man had been there. My windshield had been smashed with a rock, and someone had scraped all down the sides of my car with something sharp, presumably a giant knife that I'm lucky didn't end up in my chest. 